Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, well done for braving the weather. Well done to Minister de Bruyne for coming here and braving the weather. What is the weather like in the Marshall Islands at the moment? Pretty good, <laughs> better than here, yeah. Well, my apologies. Um, as the chief diplomat of one of the world's lowest lying atoll nations, Minister de Bruyne will discuss the existential threat and security implications of climate change and progress in negotiations towards a new global agreement on climate change scheduled to be adopted at the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris later this year. In February 2013, Minister de Brum addressed a landmark UN Security Council meeting on the security implications of climate change and later that year coordinated the Marshall Islands hosting of the Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Meeting, which produced a groundbreaking Maho Declaration for Climate Leadership. Building on the Marshall Islands' powerful example of converting 95% of its outer island communities to solar electricity, Minister de Brum has also become the world's leading voice for the transformational potential of ocean thermal energy conversion, OTEC technology, spearheading a proposal to power his home constituency of Koajalian Atoll, <laughs> possibly not pronounced that way, which hosts a US military presence. Born in 1945, Minister de Brun grew up on the island of L'Equipe during the 12-year period from 1946 to 1958, when the United States conducted 67 atomic and nuclear, thermonuclear weapon tests in the Marshall Islands. As a nine-year-old, Minister de Brun witnessed the Bravo shot at Bikini Atoll, the largest ever US nuclear test that produced an explosion 1,000 times more powerful than in Hiroshima. Throughout his life, Minister de Brun has been a tireless advocate for nuclear disarmament and is leading the Marshall Islands' current international court action against the world's nuclear powers for their failure to meet their obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Before we welcome uh, Minister de Brum on stage, you can follow him on Twitter. His Twitter account is at Minister TDB. I'm just about to do that, actually. I'll follow you on Twitter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Minister de Brum. that kind of a wonderful introduction in a long time. Thank you so very much for those kind words. <clears throat> I, I first wish to convey my sincere thanks to all of you who are here who have braved the cold, uh, and to the Grantham Institute and to the Imperial College for welcoming me to give the seminar even at quite short notice. I often feel that <clears throat> there is no more important place to look forward to the future than in the place of learning, a uh, place of invention, a place where the leaders of the next generation hone their skills, form their beliefs, and decide what kind of future they want for themselves and their children. I am honored to be here as part of that process, particularly in a fine, in as fine an academic institution as this one. Ladies and gentlemen, when I, took, when I look back on my life and my career in public service, <clears throat> one strong common thread is remarkably clear. It has been a fight. There's been a long struggle for my people, for my country, and, and for what is right. Um, <clears throat> for the Marshall Islands and ultimately for the world. It is a story that I've told in other places, but never here in the United Kingdom. And therefore, it is one that I wanted to recount here with you tonight. 
When I addressed the UN Security Council in early 2013, in a rare opportunity in that body, to discuss the security threat pro, uh, posed by climate change, I began by telling them that in 1977, after many years of difficult negotiations with the United States, I came to the United Nations to fight for the independence of the Marshall Islands. I was told then that to become my own country, we needed the blessing of the Security Council. We ultimately received that blessing in 1986, and the Marshall Islands became the 163rd member of the United Nations. But never in my wildest dreams, even then, and we were wild then, never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that I would return to the same Security Council some 35 years later, only to be told that the survival of my country was not the business of the Council. Ladies and gentlemen, I of course understand that every diplomatic forum has its mandate and its rules. And in whose warped world is the potential loss of a country not a threat to international peace and security? Not mine. My friends, I, I know an existential threat when I see one. At the age of nine, I witnessed a nuclear test in the Marshall Islands called the Bravo Shot, an explosion 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. It was just a normal day for me. I was out fishing with my grandfather, but the sky suddenly turned red in every direction, as if someone had put a bowl over our heads and poured thick blood on it trapping us under that dome. To this day, some of our islands remain so toxic that they will be uninhabitable for another 12,000 years to come. My country and my people survived that devastation. We went through unimaginable pain and suffering in the form of all kinds of horrible cancers and other health issues. And for many, forced relocation from their homeland. But we survived. So it is incredibly difficult for me to have to say to you this evening that the way things are headed, my low-lying atolls nation, one of only four anywhere in the world, will not survive climate change. The fact that things have gotten to the point, this point, reflects a lack of vision, a failure of diplomacy, and an absence of real leadership. As the world's best scientists have told us, these failures have us barreling towards a world that is three to four degrees hotter than it was in pre-industrial times. We are on a course to set in train a series of increasingly devastating impacts that would fundamentally reshape the planet as we know it. It would be a planet without the Marshall Islands, a paradise lost forever. <clears throat> While some have the luxury of waiting and preparing for the fight against climate change, for us in the Marshall Islands and in some other places in the Pacific, climate change has already arrived. In early 2013, my government was forced to declare a state of disaster after a prolonged drought across the northern atolls left many of our people without food and water. But just as help arrived from our international friends, including the United States and Australia, a king tide and rising oceans inundate our capital city to the south, Majuro, forcing the closure of our airport 
and flooding many homes. Two climate disasters in less than two months. In the 18 months that followed, Majuro was inundated again twice, and we narrowly avoided the destructive path of numerous superstorms and typhoons that have permanently scarred the islands of our friends in Micronesia, the Philippines, and Vanuatu. I've seen more Pacific typhoons in the last three months than I remember over my entire childhood. And it hasn't been even the height of the season yet. Just this week, my constituency of Ibai in Kwajalein <laughs> has been inundated with a storm surge whip, as we call it in the islands, a whip from a typhoon 1,000 kilometers away near Chu in the Carolinas. This is the harsh new reality of climate change. It is quickly becoming the biggest fight of all. As I speak now, typhoon, typhoon Dolphin is bearing down on the island of Guam in the Northern Marianas. As we all are, are painfully aware, if humanity continues to emit more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, things will continue to get worse. The growth must stop, and we must quickly reverse that trend. As the UN Secretary General said in his summary of last September's Leaders Summit on Climate Change, we need to peak global emissions as soon as possible, achieve a deep decarbonization of the global economy, and reach a climate neutral world in the second half of this century. In other words, the world must be heading in the direction of net zero emissions by around 2050. This might sound radical to some, but it's just the scientific reality we face. Thankfully, <clears throat> this is a watershed year for the international fight against the negative impacts of climate change. Ministers and world leaders are working to finalize a new international agreement in Paris this December. The contours and content of that agreement will play a big part in determining our planet's future. The unique thing about this new agreement is that it will require every country, big and small, rich and poor, to make its own contribution to the phase down of greenhouse gases, emissions all over the coming, uh, for, all, for the duration of the coming decades. Pacific Island nations have been active in this effort, building on the ambitious emissions and renewable energy targets they put forward under the Majuro Declaration for Climate Leadership which was the result of our 2013 Pacific Island Forum Leaders Meeting hosted in my country, the Marshall Islands. This brought together 18 heads of state and heads of government from all over the Pacific to Maduro for a week. But like our tiny islands, we are a mere speck on this map of the global emissions. So the challenge is a diplomatic one. And that is why I'm here in Europe, preparing once again to engage with the big boys. My task is a simple one. I must cajole and convince the big emitters, like the United States and China, that stronger climate action is not only in our interest, but it is very much in their interest as well. I'm happy to report that the message is sinking in. The United States administration is energized on climate change like it never has been before. And China is moving desperately to find, secure, or find ways to secure cleaner air, safer water supplies, and to become the world's leader in renewable energy technology. But this momentum will only be maintained if we're all moving forward together. 
My trip to Europe signals the start of perhaps the most important six months of diplomacy the world has ever seen. Momentum is building towards the, ad the, ad <clears throat> the adoption of a watershed new climate agreement in Paris this December. We now have a draft text in hand and the world's biggest economies are thankfully coming together with targets and plans to go into the agreement that will continue the phase down of greenhouse gases from 2020 onwards. The joint US-China announcement last November got the ball rolling, but we expect most of the big boys to have come forward by July of this year. That said, <clears throat> We are increasingly concerned that some of the proposed targets already on the table do not reflect the necessary ambition to keep this planet cool. We are a very long way from being able to say that they can get us to a safe trajectory. In fact, they are more consistent with warming of about, of about three degrees and not the 1.5 or two degrees we have already agreed upon. This gives me mixed feelings because on the one hand, a feeling that the governments, businesses and communities have enormous opportunity to jumpstart the necessary low carbon transmission, transformation of the world economy. And on the other hand, a deep fear that we will fail to grab that opportunity with both hands. So let me be clear, therefore, about why we are to Paris in December and what is at stake. We are not coming to Paris in December to adopt an agreement that puts an end to our future, but one that secures it. We are not coming to Paris to put our heads in, our, in the sand and pretend that the world of climate change and you know, climate science and climate impacts doesn't exist, but rather to recognize it treat it seriously, and respond to it. And we are not coming to Paris to unravel our hard-earned international climate regime into a patchwork of different objectives and approaches, but rather to strengthen it and to bring in as many actors on board as possible. So that is what we are not going to do in Paris. But what are we going to do? First. Paris must be the platform for building the greatest climate change alliance the world has ever seen. The French have borrowed my words, with my permission of course, and called it the Paris Alliance. In other words, all hands are on deck. Every government, every business, every community must be prepared to exploit every little bit of potential it has to reduce emissions. Governments must lead the way. As they themselves have made clear, the European Union, China, and the United States all have upwards wiggle room in their proposed targets and could all agree to step forward together with a little bit more ambition than their initial offers in, this, in the confidence that others are doing as well. A new ambition triangle from the world's big emitters is exactly what the doctors saw. Here in the United Kingdom, we are glad to hear this week that Amber Rudd has become the new Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. She understands the problems we face. The UK has been a great friend in the negotiations over recent years and we hope that Ms. Rudd will once again take up the mantle of leadership on our behalf and become a real champion of additional ambitions within the European Union. Second, the Paris Agreement must be designed for ambition. In the event that the targets in Paris don't yet put us on a safe trajectory, our Paris Agreement must have design features that drive up ambition over time. These include a long-term goal to phase out emissions by the middle of the century, to send a strong decarbonization signal to the private sector and the general public, and regular five, 
yearly political moments for all countries to gather together and update their targets based on the most recent science. Leaving too long between milestones for revisiting targets risks locking in low ambition for long stretches of time and failing to set our sights higher as technology and economic conditions make up our job easier. Third, the Paris Agreement must be a moral agreement, an agreement based on human solidarity. As a species confronting the greatest challenge we are yet to face, we are all in this together. Paris cannot be a success unless every country can see itself and its concerns contained in the new agreement. Paris must prioritize plans for climate resilient sustainable development, including through climate proofing critical infrastructure and adapting our econo economies to cope with the climate impacts that will inevitably come. And Paris must send a signal to the poorest and most vulnerable that the world cares for their predicament, that they will have timely access to the necessary support and that they will not be left behind. We in the Marshall Islands will bring our best effort to Paris. I will continue to shout from the treetops and use my newfound access to the ministerial tables like the big emitting major economies forum on energy and climate change to hold the big boys to account. I will continue to say that if a tiny cash-strapped country like the Marshall Islands can solarize all its outer island communities, reduce its emissions by 40% in 2020, and put climate change on the top of our diplomatic agenda, so can all of these people. It is simply about priorities. And having vision beyond the next political cycle will take the hard decision that will ultimately pay dividends, socially, economically, and environmentally. Put simply, the climate challenge is about leadership. And for me, it is about leadership for the next generation, including the three children, nine, soon to be 10 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren that I have waiting for me when I come home from Paris. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Minister Dubrum, uh, who has kindly agreed to receive questions uh, from us. And so I will uh, take the questions when Minister Dubrum will ask them, of course. Mm. Do you want to say your name and affiliation? Yeah. Uh, and then the question. Rank and serial number. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> From, from the first, uh, thank you for the question, thank you very much. From the first moment we engaged in, in, in climate change negotiations and, and, and in uh, uh, attending workshops and uh, seminars throughout the, throughout the region and, and in far corners of the world, we have always considered that climate change is really not total. You don't have to 
a total picture of climate change impact unless you take into consideration what you need to survive that phase and what happens afterwards. In other words, energy and, and its, all its implications, the renewable energy must be part of that equation. Production is what we are trying to reserve the world for in combating climate change. If we do not have the problem of climate change under control, everything else that we're talking about, sustainable energy, about production, about uh, expansion of economies, about, about improving sea transport, ocean uh, and, 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 and uh, re ocean resource uh, uh, exploitation cannot take place. The Marshalls are one of eight countries that produce, that, that provide 52% of the world's tuna. We export to the world 52% of all the tuna consumed. Because of lack of affordable energy and water, we cannot add value to that, to that, uh, to that product. So that while the Chinese and the, and the Thais and the Japanese and the Koreans uh, process the fish and, and earn incomes multiple of, of, of 10 and 20 of what we would earn from our fish, um, once we have, for example, OTEC, as we talked about earlier, producing affordable energy and water, we can turn that around and earn much more than the 10 or 15 million dollars we earn a year from the exporta exportation of 1.5 billion dollars worth of raw tuna. So we do not see the efforts at development to be separate from the efforts at controlling climate change. But what we must push ahead of the agenda is that considerations of economies and consideration of bottom line must take second place to preservation of the planet. And that is the way we've been approaching this for at least two decades now. Thank you. Another I can answer you right now. We would be honored to take part in the project and take note of it. I'm asking Almond to remember that we will carry this back. We also treasure the involvement of our younger generation in this combat. It is, it is important. It is for their future. And, they, and you'll be surprised at how many young people in the Pacific understand and want to do something about climate change. One of the most uh, uh, acclaimed uh, uh, young poets in the Marshalls, who is now a teacher, uh, Kathy Jettingen, Kathy Kitchener, um, is now designated a UN ambassador because of her poetry and her, her skills in talking about climate change in a way that attracts uh, and, and inspires people. We want to share her talent with the world as well. But what you're talking about is something that is very close to our hearts, the involvement of young people in, in, this, in this very worthy cause. 
and we will be happy to get some contact information with you before we go. Very good. Another question. Yes, please. Um, how do you see um, <clears throat> the, the problem you, you refer to is, uh, is always, uh, is always at, the, at the beginning of all discussions and at the end of all discussions when we come to climate change. There are many countries in the world who claim to be developing countries but are already developed countries. They want the benefit of being both a developing country and a developed country and enjoy the benefits of both. We try to uh, uh, convince them that they can, be, they can only be one and not the other. But it's very difficult to, some of them are quite powerful in terms of uh, financial resources. Some of them are very powerful in terms of uh, military and, and population sizes. Some of them are very, uh, very strong in terms of uh, their own uh, uh, projected growth in economies. And they, I think, the b biggest error uh, in that debate is that developing countries do not see the opportunities that are out there in alternate energy, for example, and investment in, in this whole climate change business. I think that if they, if they did that, they would, they would see the value, that there is true value in, in, this, in this crisis and that it can be turned around so that we can have not only the development they seek, but the development they seek in a clean and healthy environment. And we think that it's still possible. And, and many countries are embarked on, on ways to engage their citizens in that endeavor. We do not see being removed from our homeland as a viable option. We do not think that uh, we've reached a situation where uh, the impending, uh, the predicted impending level sea, uh, sea level rise and, and other uh, other aspects of, of climate change uh, may, may drive us away from our homeland. We do not see that as yet a problem to deal with at this point. Of course, prudent leaders must keep that always in the back of their, their heads, that there must be a plan B if that happens. Our efforts and our struggle now is, con is concentrated on preventing that from happening. Of course, there are some of our colleagues, Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, have already expressed interest in finding shelter, say, in Fiji or other high uh, mountainous uh, countries in the Pacific. But we have been displaced and kicked around in our own soil for the last 200 years. The Marshall Islands have, been, have seen this effect of displacement since the time that whalers arrived in the islands 180 years ago. We have seen displacement of populations to make room for the atomic and nuclear tests. We have seen people being displaced for, to make space for missile and, and rocketry testing by the United States, as well as Japanese bases from World War II. The idea of being moved around against your will is not new to us. And people thought that that would give us the resilience and, 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 and the, the willingness to 
pick up stakes and move around as, as climate dictates. We do not believe that. We think that our energy should be concentrated on preventing that from happening, on buying time, for example. Many of our islands were fortified at the end of the war and due in preparation for the war by the Japanese. Uh, built, uh, bases were built by the Americans after the war, which did not take into consideration the very fragile uh, uh, ecological balance in the Natal geography. So many islands were connected by causeways a lot of new land was built uh, using uh, techniques of, of landfill and, and, and uh, backfilling the, uh, uh, the reefs and, 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 and spaces between the islands that had been there naturally for thousands of years. As a result, many of the small atolls, this is true in Tuvalu, it's true in Kiribati, it's true in the Marshalls, uh, they have areas in their capital atolls that are more susceptible to king tides and to the high tides and to, and to climate change than other parts of the atoll. One of the early adaptation measures that we can take now, for example, is to restore these islands to their original condition. It would be cheaper than trying to build up another three or four meters of, of land that will only be susceptible again to climate change uh, uh, impact. But if we restored some of these islands, that will buy us time because the free flow of, of, the, of the waters of the rising sea will not be as destructive to the shoreline communities as they are now. We believe that that would be our adaptation priority. And then that will give us a little bit of time to see what we can do to convince the emitters to back off on their emitting practices. And I think that uh, that is a little bit more sane than simply saying, okay, uh, people of the Marshalls, uh, it's time for you to pack up and move to America or Australia. Under the Compact of Free Association we have with the United States, we are, we are free to enter the United States at any time, take up residence, uh, jobs, go to school, or seek medical care. So there is that uh, pressure valve, sort of safety valve, in, in the event of, of, uh, of immediate need to move. But we do not view that as something desirable. Not only from our own uh, way of thinking and the way we want to keep our tradition and our life and our language and our people and our language, uh, the, the, what is Marshallese, but also we do not want that thought to enter into the planning cycles of the big countries who will then say, let's not worry about climate change because if these people become threatened, we'll just pick them up and move them someplace else. That is not a solution. And that is the way we are playing this at this moment. There are a lot of dark clouds in, in, in front on this road to Paris. But we still believe that we have a chance to make something happen, something positive happen. Otherwise, I would not be here. My colleagues would not be here to do some of the things that we're doing with IMO and with other organizations to try and get them excited about doing something, climate change. We think that the road to Paris can be successful if we get 
if we can get the big emitters, the big boys, to sit down and be a little, more, a little bit more ambitious in, in their, in their, uh, in their uh, contributions, as they call them. We think that the road to Paris can be more successful if we can identify areas of cooperation in energy development, in clean energy renewable development, renewable energy development. Uh, later this week, uh, early next week, I will be sitting with uh, representatives of the French DCNS. I don't know exactly what the DCNS stands for, but it is a major uh, contractor, government contractor in uh, mostly usually be, used to be in shipping and and and, uh, and defense. But they are one of the world leading. Uh, 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 entities in the development of the ocean thermal energy conversion, OTEC, as was mentioned earlier. And we want to pursue the development of that technology in the islands with them as well. So there are opportunities that, that are along the way to Paris. But the important thing is to keep your eyes on the, the ultimate goal of keeping the temperature at two degrees. Because that's what's going to kick left and right when when all is said and done. That's what's going to determine just what next will happen after Paris. We also think that uh, our, uh, friends in the French uh, our friends in the French leadership are doing a remarkably wonderful job in trying to pull every resource they can together to make, make sure that Paris is a success. We'll also use Paris to demonstrate to the world what we have done, small island countries, uh, to, to, to gain a level of, of survivability, if you, if, you, if you wish. And it is more than just uh, trying to come away with a climate uh, alliance agreement. It is, it is more of a setting the platform upon which you can plan further what needs to be done uh, in the next two or three decades prior to the mid-century deadline. Thank you. One last question. I, I wish I knew the, the real answer to that question. Uh, what, what I've been trying to say is that we will use every avenue available to us at this point. We will use every, every way to check and balance that, that development uh, with whatever tools we have available to us and whatever leverage we have with any of the, any of the big emitters. Uh, I think also that we can help convince the world that this is not just a small island, small country problem. We, we, we may be, uh, it has been described before that we are the canary in the mine in the, uh, in, in the past. If we reach three degrees and the islands are inundated, uh, it is not just the islands that will, will suffer this impact of climate change. It will, they will be the first, they are the tip of the spear, but the whole world will come very, very fast behind and start feeling these effects of climate change before anybody has a chance to predict any more uh, ambitious uh, targets. It is important that, uh, that the big emitters of the world recognize this, that this is not just something that you can isolate and say, okay, we'll take care of the Marshallese and put them in Wyoming, or we'll take care of the Gilgus people and put them in Australia. Because if we reach that point where displacement is necessary, that means that the world is already responding to climate change in a way that may be difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. The other thing is that we can help convince <clears throat> the big emitters that the time to act is now by 
pointing out in spreadsheets just how more expensive it's going to be to deal with the problems of climate change if we tarry, if we wait longer, if we don't do take action now, if we say, okay, we'll, we'll fix that in 2030 or 2040 when the problem really becomes manifest because that will be even more difficult to fix than if we did it now. And that's the science, that's the technology. Marry them up with a little bit of political will and I think we've got the answer. Thank you. And I think we'll end at that, that place. Minister, thank you ever so much for you and, and colleagues uh, for getting hold of your thoughts, for being with us. We're really grateful, grateful that you're with us. Um, uh, thank you are uh, hugely impressed by the powerful and important message that you've articulated so, so clearly. Um, we think it's very important that, uh, that um, people here receive that message and get to know more about uh, the Marshall Islands and, uh, and your um, uh, ability to convey this important message. And we wish you all the best of luck for the negotiation in Paris. We're sure they'll go well. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.